as soon as you started talking to me recently on the phone, I realized that you're thinking about <clears throat> dogs like in a way like, are they ready to learn? Are they in the right headspace? And you talked about that a lot. And I think that's so important and so overlooked by a lot of amateur handlers. Did you happen to look at the uh, video that I sent you earlier today? Because I sent you a couple of videos. I did. I watched them both. Okay. And uh, what it was, was um, dogs were confined inside today, unfortunately, in here in New England because of the, the rain that, that's turned everything to ice. Um, we have a patience chain. Um, the, the Smiths who introduced us to us were a big Hunt Smith followers, you know, called it the chain gang. And we, we towed it the, uh, the, the patience chain. And for us, it's the dogs need to get into the mind frame to be open for learning. What does that include? Um, a relaxed dog, a calm dog, a dog that's not just yanking against the chain, that's barking, that's fighting with its neighbor and digging holes and carrying on. It We equate it because we pull into our kennel facility and we have a, a gun dog patience chain and obedience patience chain. And in the height of our busyness, we could have 30 dogs on the obedience patience chain and another 20, 25 dogs on the uh, gun dog patience chain of every variety. Uh, we've trained German shepherds for people for gun dogs. We've trained mixes and then we train some phenomenal purebred dogs and on the same on the, the obedience side and people pull into the facility and look up and cannot believe that they'll see 25 dogs in a row laying down, waiting their turn to get worked. And they point right away and they say, I want that. And for the people who might be skeptics who see a dog on a chain, on a 16 inch chain, where the only way that they can get comfortable is to move into the pressure and lay down and relax. I say, how is that any different from looking at a, a school room full of kids politely sitting at their desk? How is that any different? That's the environment that we're trying to create. Mm -hmm. Well, and so let's explain this, this, patience chain first, and then let's get into how, or at least why it works. So can you mm -hmm. just explain it? Sure. And again, you know, trainers, 25 years of training, I have to, I have to give accolades to people that and mentors that I've trained under. And there's been many, many from the retriever world to the pointing dog world. And it really is Rick Smith and uh, Delmar Smith, who I've learned a lot from studying and recently Ronnie. Um, but really Rick has been a phenomenal mentor for me coming out to our facility for, I think the past six or seven years now, once or twice a year. And Delmar will say that his favorite piece of training equipment is the, the, the chain, because it ultimately in a, in order for a dog to get comfortable, they have to yield, which is move into the neck pressure, lay down and relax. Well, um, most people, when they have a dog on a leash, have the rudest hands. Uh, you watch most people who are holding a dog leash and they have it wrapped around their hand, super tight, and the poor dog has nowhere to go. So the idea behind the patient's chain is they don't have the influence with a human being holding them. They basically, by common sense, learn if they pull, they can't win. If you have your chain secured correctly, it doesn't pull out of the ground. And when they stop pulling against it and they yield and give to that pressure, they basically, um, they can control it. Uh, sadly, when most dogs are on a leash, and I made a bunch of notes about this because it's something that I wanted to talk to, why do dogs pull? Because people won't stop holding them tightly. Mm -hmm. So the patient's chain enables a dog to control sort of its destiny that if they don't want pressure, all they have to do is move into the pressure, lay down and relax. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> this patient's chain is just, your, yours looks in the video, looks like a cable. And you said they're like 16 inch tethers on there. And these mm -hmm. dogs, you know, they have enough space where they're not up in each other's business. And all of these dogs are different varieties. They're not just gun dogs. There's all kinds of dogs mixed in there and they're all just laying there calmly waiting for their mm -hmm. chance to work. And so this is, this is something we hear from a lot of uh, professional trainers who talk about give the dog the choice, like to take the pressure off because that's, mm -hmm. then it's their decision. And what you're saying, and I want to get into this with you, but what you're saying is this method of this patience chain, this dog has two choices, fight like crazy and get mm -hmm. that undesirable neck pressure mm -hmm. or yield to it, settle down and just wait for your chance to work or to, for some kind of reward. And that's, that's the important part. And 
so when we talk about, you know, people reach out to us all the time, like, oh, well, my dog pulls on the leash, my dog pulls on the leash. And I want to get into that with you. But you've just said, all right, we're taking the people equation out of this and letting the dog mm-hmm. decide its own fate. And it's amazing to see. And you can see this. You can look up Jennifer on YouTube and you can see these dogs. Um, it's amazing to see the behavioral shift when they're in control. And they go, well, I, you know, am I going to strangle myself to death or am I going to just lay down and and yield and enjoy what's coming next? Mm-hmm. It, it also, um, to be truthful, it gives us the opportunity, if they're still pulling, 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 and fighting with their neighbor or digging holes, then we will step in and give them a correction. We'll correct, usually with some type of a physical touch, whether it be, um, I I give you a whap with the end of my leash or a healing stick, or even I pressure you with my space and and controlling your space. There's There's things that we'll do to correct them for the obnoxious barking, digging, fighting with the neighbor. So ultimately, they really just learn how to lay down, flake out, chill out. Mm-hmm. And I mean, like what percentage of dogs you see come in that, that require that level? Um, almost every dog, when you first put them on the chain, has a meltdown because they've never been held accountable to be patient. Mm-hmm. Um, they sadly, I find a lot of clients do crate train their dogs, but then there's a time they let them out of crate too soon or they don't practice what I call forced downtime. Okay. Um, when people think that a crate is cruel, I say, you know, to me in a human terms, a crate is someone coming over to me, the fairy godmother flying in, handing me a cocktail and a hammock and say, Jen, leave your busy kennel life with, you know, all these employees and all this stuff going on. Here's a, here's a hammock and a cocktail and go chill out. And I'm like, I'm in. So that when you can teach a dog to have an off switch, you're practicing downtime. And so many people, keep their dogs way too engaged. They give them the free run of the backyard and then they own the backyard. They give them free run of the house and they own the house. They're loose in a truck. So their backs barking, barking. The idea with the crate or a patient's chain is practice and off switch. Um, I was kind of making a joke because you're leaving for a pheasant trip after this. And I was wondering mm-hmm. how fidgety you would be because it's hard for me to practice an off switch because I rarely turn off. So even if we have house guests over, I'll find myself up, down, getting a glass of water. It's hard for me to sit still because unfortunately the type A personality, the busy person I am, I don't practice relaxation enough. Um, I certainly have my dogs practice relaxation. I wish mm-hmm. I practiced it more. <laughs> well, mm-hmm. you should, you should do some, some yoga yeah, and some meditation yoga. or something. <laughs> yeah. um, but it's, <clears throat> you know, I, I don't, I don't know this is something just occurred to me when you were talking about this with dog behavior and the crate, you know, a crate is a, it, is an awesome tool for a couple of reasons. You know, it, it is that forced downtime, it's steadiness. Um, it's just, it, it, you know, it ties into the safety, obviously, and transport mm-hmm. and everything. But it's also, there's probably also an evolutionary benefit to it. And, you know, dogs, they're den animals, yes, you know, I mean, it, where they come from, it's, we, you know, we look at it like it's a, it's a little prison cell. Mm-hmm. They don't probably look at it the same way. They, and especially if they're introduced right away as puppies and there's positive, association with it they don't look at that like oh my god they're putting me in jail you know they may protest because they learn they can manipulate you but it's not a bad thing for them to be in there and that you know what you're talking about like developing the off switch i mean that might be the number one problem with duck dogs probably for sure you know upland dogs maybe not but it's it's still a a huge factor as far as, you know, manners in the field, manners at home. And it's an unnatural behavior to some extent to be steady. You know, dogs, you know, just like you say, you don't want to be steady. I don't Mm -hmm. want to be steady. Mm -hmm. They don't want to be, but it's good for them. And that that's all part of it. And so is, you know, your patient's chain is just, it's playing off of the same kind of behavioral reward and the, the, the behavioral necessity maybe of our modern dogs. Yeah. Yeah. So you're, uh, you're you're thinking about dogs in in what's good for them and what they need to be doing as a professional trainer and your you know your task is to get the amateur handlers who come in and say Jennifer make my dog better getting them to understand okay well this is what we have to do like what I'm I'm curious you know with 25 years in the rearview mirror doing this like 
is the modern dog owner, sporting dog owner, or just general dog owner, are they, do they look at that patient's chain and go, uh, I don't know. Or do they, do they get a little worked up if you're like, no, this dog gets kenneled X amount of hours a day? Sure. So we, we host seminars almost on a monthly basis. Um, we have a, a lot of people that come through the kennels, a lot of dogs that we train. And it's amazing. Rarely do I have people that, that humans that don't buy into the chain because a lot of them say, I wish my dog could just do that. And I say, well, well they can. And let me teach you the methodology, the mentality behind it. And they see the dog so relaxed. And when a trainer approaches, the dogs calmly wag their tail they have beautiful body language that they're portraying to each trainer. The dogs are. And you just show that they're completely open and receptive to learning. They're put me in coach. I'm ready to play. And I don't, I don't even have to explain it. The, when the people see it, they buy in because they see how effective that it is. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's just, it's a, it's something that once they witness it, they're, they're all in for it. Yeah, they really are. Yeah. It's, I mean, it, it's kind of, I can't remember if it was you and I that talked about this, but it's, it's like place training without a choice, <laughs> kind of, yeah. you know, I mean, it's like, you know, uh, place training, it, you know, it, it has its benefits in the field, of course, but I think probably more people are interested in it now uh, from the perspective of just manners at home when somebody knocks on the door or keeping your dog well behaved in the, in the hotel room or wherever, but it's kind of a similar concept and it ties into so much of what we want out of our dogs now is like, Hey, you have to do this good behavior. And if you do something, mm -hmm. something that you like will happen later and you're in, you're seeing sure. that. So in a really great eye opener again, of being in, in, introduced to the Smith method, uh, that, eight plus years ago is, is previously I've, I'd have my kennel full of training dogs and I'd walk in, I'd put a dog on a leash, I'd take them out and I would do our lessons for, for the moment. Um, how long it depend on the dog, the training situation, the moment, whatever, 20 minutes, half hour, heck, some dogs you might struggle for a longer amount of time. And then I'd walk them back and put them in their kennel run, at which point they could bark, they could pace, they could throw a meltdown. And how good is that truly for their overall learning? If they're able to come out, learn, get in a great zone and mindset, but then be able to go back and undo it all through crazy, obnoxious behavior, having a meltdown with the application of the patient's chain. If I have 12 to 16 dogs personally in my string that I'm working, I can walk all 15 dogs out to the line. I can manage the behaviors at one time of 15 dogs. And the dogs are with me now all day long. A day could be six hours, eight hours, two hours. Mm -hmm. But throughout that entire time, I'm practicing downtime. The dogs can't wait for their turn. When they see you approaching, they're like, me, me, my turn, my turn. You take them off. You might do a 10-minute exercise on an on a adventure agility type course that we use. And we put them right back up again. And we let them contemplate it. And, we, and I'll tell you, I'm able to get more accomplished with that type of training mindset and that great usage of time than, you know, walking into the kennel, getting a dog, taking it out, whatever. It's basically group training. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that the dog, I don't, I'm not a believer that a dog will learn obedience by watching another dog work. But I'll tell you what, on the gun dog line, we can take a shyer, more, a more shy one-year-old lab and put it next to some confident dogs, not out of control, but confident dogs that have like birds. And we could do in the field bird training. And the dog has that power of the pack of his buddies on either side who are lunging, who want to be part of it. And that helps to build their confidence. They can hear gunshot at a distance. That's not how we do introductions, but they can mm -hmm. hear gunshot at a distance and have sort of the pack mentality of the confidence and stuff. So I do learn in the gun dog line, I do truly believe that they can learn some great habits in those situations. Mm -hmm. um, obedience, I think that they continue to learn manners and self-control in the face of a lot of distractions. <laughs> well, it, and I agree with you. And it, the, the point you bring up about observation is I just, I can't, I can't talk about it too much yet because it's not published, but I just got to see a paper, a research paper on this with with canines and you know whether do they do they really learn by observation do they really imitate do they imitate other dogs do they imitate us 
and it was fascinating. And I'm, I'm working on getting getting some of the people who contributed on this when this thing gets published. But we get asked that a lot, like, okay, well, I have an eight year old lab and I have a lab puppy. If I hunt them together, that puppy's going to watch that older lab and learn. And you know the. The opinions from the trainers I've talked to, some of them are like, dogs don't learn anything from other dogs. And it's, gen- I think it's generally accepted that, you know, or believed, you know, people go, oh, my dog learns from older dogs or my dog learned. And I'm kind of like, I'm kind of leaning toward like, no, nah, nah, I don't really think so. But some of the research that's coming out, it's like, well, maybe, but you're saying in the obedience realm, you don't believe that at all. No, but definitely in the behavioral, behavioral and pack mentality round. So for instance, I will have 20 dogs out on the line and they're used to me and the other trainers walking and working around them and stuff. If we get a stranger come walking up and one dog might give a low bellow growl, the pack might join in instantly. If we go over and correct one dog that's being obnoxious, and he might give a squeal whine because you just laid into him for something really bad. The rest of them kind of look and go, oh, we don't think we're going to do that either. So there's a great pack mentality to be learned. Um, but no, if I'm out there teaching a puppy how to sit, uh, his litter mate is not going to learn how to sit because I'm teaching him. <laughs> um, if I had to lay into, like I said, lay into yeah. a dog or something, then they all kind of go, oh, my goodness. Um, but um yeah, there's a definitely an incredible energy that's created that we in a, in a zone that we try to create with the application of that patient's chain. For sure. And, you know, you mentioned this earlier, and, and maybe this is just maybe this doesn't make any sense or not, but there seems to be like some value to a dog that's laying down, being patient. It sees, you know, the the dog on either side of it get picked and gets to go work for 10 minutes and do something cool. And they get to watch this and they know, you know, their excitement level after that dog gets tied back up and you walk up to that dog's probably a little bit higher. Like, Oh man, I just got to see this really cool stuff. Now I get to do it. There's probably some recognition just from observation there. Yeah, there definitely, there definitely is. And we, we vary things so much. So if I have a really positive session with a particular dog and we're training them in this fenced in arena, I might let that dog loose afterwards to then go enjoy. And it's kind of funny because they all start doing the obstacles on their own and they're top of an A-frame and they're almost showing off on their own to the other dogs. And again, you can, you can sense the pack mentality. You can sense them. um, Hey, I'll go work now. Can I, then I get some social time. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting stuff to observe. The, the pack thinking about dogs in their natural pack environment is it's sort of an abstract concept to us, but it's so important. They mm-hmm. the way they learn and the way they think and they behave is tied into that you know that mm-hmm. evolution so tightly. Um, I wanted to ask you, you know, both in your in your video and or your videos and talking to you, you've mentioned like reading a dog, like mm-hmm. looking at a dog and going, okay, this this dude's in the right headspace, or this one, you know, she's not quite there yet. And I think I, I'm, I'm becoming obsessed with the body language going back and forth, like what they're doing and what we do and how they read us, how we read them. Because we can't, we think we communicate through commands and we yeah. kind of do, but we're we're saying a hell of a lot more through what we do. And they're saying a lot more what mm-hmm. they do. And you seem to be really, really into that on I reading am. dogs. I am. Again, Huge accolades to Rick Smith for teaching this to me, uh, Ronnie for for bringing it to light. I'm reading his book. I'm I'm loving his book. Just mm-hmm. it's it's phenomenal. Everybody should read it. Um, I'm also bringing in my past experiences with training horses, my own horses, doing round pen training of natural horsemanship, identifying when a horse cues an ear on you and lowers their head and relaxes their muscles and licks and chews. Those are the signs that you look for that a horse is engaged and you're, 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 te- you're in a teaching learning frame of mind. So <sighs> love teaching this to my clients because people will say, um, I train my dog every day. And I I look at the dog and the dog is reverberating with excitement, their dog. And let's just take a Labrador retriever. So um, they have the dog on a leash. He'll sit. And the dog is just absolutely reverberating, ears up, um, just a lot of action and a lot of busyness going on. 
very often that dog's body language and emotions are saying it's not bought in. So again, reflecting accolades to the Smith family for for bringing this so to light with me, but my gosh, am I a student of this now. Every dog that I work, no matter the breed, the age, the background, shows the specific same body languages when they are open and receptive to learning and bought into your training. The first thing is the ears. So when a dog drops their ears or pulls their ears back, they're listening. Humans are much more oriented with our eyes. Mm -hmm. So if you were coaching me right now and I started glancing off, looking at my watch, looking around, you you would kind of know that you lost me, right? If I'm working a dog and if he's looking at me and his ears are triangulated up, shepherd triangulated forward, lab triangulated at me, they're paying attention, but they're often pretty intrigued. They're, they're maybe a higher level of excitement. As soon as the ears drop down or back, they're in a calmer, open, receptive mindset to listen. So what does that mean? Because they allow themselves to get in that calmer mindset to learn, you're able to use much lighter cues, sit, a touch. You're not yelling at them, okay? Um, what's the next thing? Man, you start watching when you do lessons with your dog, how much they lick. So when I take a dog to do obedience and I cue them to move, cue them with the leash, they lick. And I cue them to sit and they lick. It's an acknowledgement and, and uh, it's just a form of acknowledgement that they're paying attention and being respectful. What's the, the next thing? Batting of the eyes. When you can start to see the dog batting their eyes, so we've got ears back, licking their lips, even relaxing and yawning and batting of the eyes. You have a dog that's literally like a person leaning in, folding their hands, saying, what are you trying to teach me? And when the dogs are in that open, receptive mindset, there's so much that you can teach them. 